Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kristen Dolan, and I'm the Assistant Director of Operations and Strategy for the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine at UCSF. I'm pleased to introduce tonight Dr. Susan Lynch, the chair of this course and the presenter of tonight's session. Dr. Susan Lynch is a professor in the UCSF Department of Medicine, director of the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine, and the associate director of Microbiome and Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program. Dr. Lynch has been conducting research on the human microbiome for over 15 years to uncover the role of the microbiome in defining host health. Her research interests spanned everything from understanding how the microbiome is established in very early life, using information about the microbiome to predict the development of diseases like asthma and uh, IBD, and creating microbial biotherapeutics to treat and prevent disease. Dr. Lynch will now give a brief overview of what you can expect from this course and then present the very first lecture. Go ahead, Dr. Lynch. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. And I am just delighted um, to welcome everybody here this evening for this first in our series of uh, public lectures on this relatively new and very exciting field of human microbiome research. And over the next six weeks, you will hear you know, some of the really wonderful work that is happening in this field, um, not just at UCSF in our microbiome center, but nationally and, and globally. Um, and you'll hear everything from how we're leveraging large data sets that we generate in microbiome studies to predict disease, right down to how our microbiome impacts our mood, influences what happens to our diet uh, and the pharmaceuticals we consume, and how microbes interact with our immune response, which we kind of think of as the rheostat for human health to dictate states of health and disease. And so this evening we'll kick off uh, with uh, the first lecture, which will provide us with a little background on the field, it, its genesis, how we got started on this um, journey of understanding the diverse microbial species that call our human bodies home. What we've learned in the 15 years since this uh, field of research has uh, begun and how we're using that knowledge to better understand human biology at its most fundamental level, as well as promoting uh, the health of the human population. Okay, just to begin with, just by way of disclosure, uh, I want to disclose that I co-founded, I direct, and I uh, consult for Shield the Therapeutics Incorporated, and I act as a consultant for Solario Bio, but I won't speak about any of the work that's going on with either of those companies in the presentation tonight. So how did we get started in the field of human microbiome research? Well, we owe the genesis of the field to luminaries in the field of environmental microbiome research. And really a, a key paper in the field in the mid 1980s in which James Staley and Alnum Kanapka observed that the diversity of microbes in just a few milliliters of water that they could observe under the microscope was never recapitulated when they tried to grow those microbes under uh, the conditions of uh, media growth in a laboratory. And they coined this the great plate count anomaly. And this led to luminaries in the field of environmental microbial ecology to develop novel uh, approaches to understand and detect the great diversity of microbes that we knew were present in environmental samples uh, without ever having to culture or grow those organisms in the lab. And this led to an expansion of tools. Um, and not least, uh, these tools have rapidly developed with their application to human samples. And so the, the first of these tools leverages um, DNA extracted from human samples um, and leverages a gene called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. This is a gene that is found only in bacteria, not in any other higher or organisms. And it's a really useful gene for profiling the types of bacteria in a given sample in that it has regions of the gene that are highly conserved. They're the same in every bacterial species we know. And they intersperse these, intersperse these highly variable regions of sequence. And so what we can do is we can amplify that gene. We can take that gene out of all of the different bacteria in a mixed species community and sequence them. 
and sequence their hypervariable region, and in doing so, identify which organisms or which bacteria these genes came from. And so that allows us to generate a really high resolution bacterial fingerprint of what kinds of organisms are present in any kind of sample, an oral sample, a, a dermal, a skin swab, uh, and understand the types of bacteria that are there and how they differ across populations of individuals. We can also do this for fungi using, re using regions like the interspacer region two. Again, this is a region of the genome and fungi, the sequence of which allows us to classify which fungal species are present in a given sample. But this approach really just tells us the composition or, or which bacteria are present in a microbiome. The um, development of shotgun metagenomics as a tool allows us to understand what genes are encoded by each of those microbes in a given community. And remember that each microbial species and even strain has its own genome encoding its own suite of uh, genes. And so this uh, approach takes the same DNA we extract from a sample. And instead of just focusing on one gene to identify who's there, the DNA is shredded and we sequence all of that DNA and understand, we start trying to put them back together, the genomes of these organisms and understand what they encode in the kind of pan-genome or multi-species uh, members of uh, a microbiome. And this tells us, again, the functional capacity of these microbiomes. What are the genes that they encode and how might they differ across different groups of, for example, patients versus healthy individuals? And that's very useful in understanding uh, genetic functional differences that exist between those strata. However, it doesn't tell us what is functionally expressed from those genomes. And to do that, we turn to RNA. So these are, this is the, the molecule that encodes the instructions for making proteins and small molecules. And by sequencing uh, essentially RNA, we can get a sense of what genes are actually actively being expressed by a microbiome. And that allows us to understand the changing responses of microbiomes at the transcriptional level to various um, conditions that they are exposed to. And all of these approaches are facilitated by next generation sequencing based technologies, which allow us to generate millions and millions of sequences in single runs, allowing us to generate these very high profile and high resolution um, uh, profiles of microbiomes, their composition, their functional genes, and what they're transcribing. But along with these approaches to understand these aspects of microbiomes, We've also developed uh, rapidly our capacity in the detection of small molecules using mass spectrometry instrumentation. And here, much like we're doing with sequencing, we can detect thousands of small molecules produced by a microbiome. These can be either proteins, which we call uh, metaproteomics, so profiling the suite of proteins produced by a microbiome. And that tells us something about the proteins that are expressed and the enzymic capacities or the catalytic functions of microbes in a, in a microbiome. We can also use this approach to look at small molecules that are produced by, by microbiomes. And as we've applied these approaches, we begin to understand that these small molecules serve as the lexicon between microbiomes and their host and forge that interaction, that communication by the microbiome and its host. So these collectively, these tools allow us to understand which microbes are present, what genes they encode, what they can express from those genes under given conditions, and the small molecules that they produce that facilitate interactions with the human host. And so the application of these tools to human biospecimens has really led us to a very different view of, of human biology. We now realize after 15 years of microbiome research that we are actually, as humans, are holobionts, our superorganisms. We're a conglomerate of mammalian and microbial cells. And in fact, each individual houses about 100 trillion microbial cells in, in an individual body. The largest burden of these cells, about 95% of them are found in the lower gastrointestinal tract. And in a study um, conducted on about 1,200 individuals um, from the US, Europe, and Asia, where their, their fecal microbiome was sequenced with shotgun metagenomics, we discovered that there were about 10 million 
distinct microbial genes in just that 1,200 subset that were sampled of the entire um, human race, indicating that microbial genes in the human body far outnumber those of the human genome, which uh, has a count of about 22,000 genes. But I think what makes us most excited about this field is that the microbiome is plastic. It is flexible. We can mold it. And it seems to be more medically accessible and manipulable than the human genome, though with the advent of, of CRISPR, some might argue that that may not be the case uh, more recently. So how do microbiomes develop? Well, it turns out that you're not just born with a set of microbes that you harbor throughout life course. Microbiomes evolve with us, uh, and they evolve over lifespans. In very early life, we and other groups have now shown that there is evidence for viable microbes in the human fetal intestine, and that these microbes that we find in our case in about 30% of the, of the specimens that we examined, these microbes are potently immunogenic. They are capable of interacting with the host immune response in the fetus, in utero, and actually in, in the case of the microbes that we detected, they downregulate inflammatory responses, suggesting that these might be the earliest colonizers of the human body, and that they are beginning to explain to the immune system how to tolerate them in that system. At birth, there is a, a microbiome in the meconium, as you might imagine. And over the first three years of life, this represents a very rapid period of microbial accumulation into the gut microbiome, but we're also beginning to understand that this is true across other sites in the body, on the surface of the skin and in the upper airways. By about three years of age, the distribution of microbes in the gut microbiome resembles that of an adult microbiome. However, the function of these microbes at this stage of life is vastly different from that seen in adolescence or in later adulthood and in uh, senior years. We continue to uh, evolve our microbiome over time as we age uh, and as we decline and, be, and um, enter the senior years, we see a, a devil, devolution of the microbiome with a loss of diversity quite characteristic at this stage of life. So at any stage of life, we're on a, a microbial trajectory. We're on a journey with our microbiome as it evolves with us over lifespans. And because of the very um, early obvious microbial development in early life, we've begun thinking quite a lot about how this parallels a critical period in immune maturation and physiological development, suggesting that what occurs in very early life may set the stage for immune maturation and development of the individual, and more about that a little later on. But beyond that temporal gradient or that temporal evolution of the microbiome over time, we also know that the microbiome is spatially organized in the human host. And this was a, a really wonderful study from Zamora and colleagues in, in 2018, where they extensively sampled the length of the gastrointestinal tract from the, the, the fundus, the stomach, the antrum, right down through the small intestine, large intestine, right down to the, the rectum. And what they found is they sampled both the, the lining of the gut, the mucosa, the contents of the gut, the, the lumen, and biopsies that they collected along this uh, gastrointestinal tract was that the burden of bacteria in the upper gastrointestinal tract is much lower than that seen in the terminal ileum and the lower uh, gastrointestinal tract. And as I mentioned earlier on, this is how we know that we house the largest burden of bacteria in the, in the lower GI tract. But what they also showed that it really depends on where you sample what kinds of microbes that you encounter. This is called a principal components plot. And it's a way that we um, examine differences in microbiomes. So each spot represents the 16S profile or the fingerprint of bacteria found in a specific type of sample. And so for here, for example, in light blue are stool samples. And the distance between one spot and any other spot on this plot tells you how similar the profile of bacteria are in any one sample compared to all other samples. The closer the distance, 
the more alike the microbiome bacterial community in this case is. And here you can see that the stool samples in these 10 healthy individuals are all quite similar and that they're most closely related to the samples collected both in the lumen and in the mucosa of the lower gastrointestinal tract and most distinct from those sampled in the upper gastrointestinal tract. So the point of this is that it really matters where we sample. It really matters where we take our biospecimens from because that represents a site that houses in healthy individuals very specific types of microbes. And this is not just true of the gastrointestinal tract. This has also been demonstrated in the respiratory tract where we see that the gradient of particle exposures from the environment, for example, pollutants, the pH of the system, the surface area of the system, oxygen availability, carbon dioxide concentrations, levels of humidity and temperature impact in a very predictable way the density and types of microbes that exist in various niches along uh, the, the respiratory tract. This is also true in the, on the skin surface. This is a really beautiful study by Wautras and, and colleagues published uh, almost a, a decade ago now where they uh, painstakingly sampled all across the dermal surface of healthy individuals. And as you can see, with blue indicating lower diversity and red indicating higher diversity, there are very distinct microbial islands at each site on the dermal surface that they sampled. And though I don't show it here, each of these sites had its own particular small molecule or metabolome associated with these sites. So what this tells us is that there are strong intrinsic factors that shape the types of microbes that are present at discrete body habitats in healthy individuals. And that these uh, influence which organisms are permitted to subsist in these niches um, and, and exist and interact with the host. And so to add to the complexity of human microbiome research, there's also a broad range of environmental exposures that shape the types and the activities of microbes at any one of these niches across our human body. And this is just a really wonderful illustration of some of the key factors that we know influence our microbiomes. And these range from our own ecosystems, the built environment that we live in, and the exposure to biodiversity are pollutants. And these influence not just our own personal microbiomes, but the environmental microbiomes that also shape our personal microbiomes. In addition, social factors such as socioeconomic status, uh, social prejudices, uh, et cetera, also are now linked to the types and activities of microbes in microbiomes across the human host physical and chemical exposures, including antimicrobials and other pharmaceuticals, we also know influence the microbiome. In the case of antimicrobials, we know that even a single antimicrobial administration leads to the development of a very skewed microbiome on the dermal surface that is enriched for antimicrobial resistance determinants, indicating that antimicrobial administration has profound and in cases it's been shown pervasive effects on the microbiome and its activities in the human host. In addition to these factors, lifestyle factors, uh, a strong one being diet. The, the types of um, dietary substrates that we provide our microbiome shape who is present in the gut especially, but also the small molecules that that microbiome produces. And you'll hear more about this from Peter Turnbaugh in a later lecture in the series. Exercise levels influence our microbiome as well as factors such as environmental tobacco smoke, which shapes the upper airway microbiome and the gastrointestinal microbiome as has been shown in some recent studies. So to really pull all of this together and think about the microbiome across kind of temporal and spatial um, gradients with these environmental exposures that uh, additionally shape the, the types and activities of organisms found in these ecosystems. How I like to think about it is that if we take a sample from anyone at any stage of life, the composition and the activities of the microbiome in their specific personal microbiome in any one site is really a reflection of intrinsic and extrinsic influences on those microbes. And some of these influences are compounding over time.
meaning that they compound damage to uh, the microbiome over time. And so then it's not surprising that increasingly we are finding that perturbations to microbiomes across various body habitats are associated with an ever expanding range of diseases. And so for example, dermatological conditions like psoriasis are associated with expansion of pathogenic Staphylococcus aureus um, species. Whereas in the airways, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease and, and conditions like asthma are associated with increased diversity. The lower airways normally has a very low burden and diversity of microbes, but in conditions of chronic airway inflammation, they are profoundly colonized by a diversity of organisms, including many respiratory pathogens. In the gut, um, gut microbiome perturbation is associated with conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, but I think what's really exciting is that we're increasingly observing that perturbations to the gut microbiome are also related to a number of conditions and disorders and diseases that manifest at sites remote from the gut microbiome, suggesting that the gut microbiome, as I mentioned, which houses the largest number and diversity of microbes within the human holobiont, may actually be the fulcrum for human health and a key site that integrates all of these environmental exposures and therefore its productivity related to those selective pressures influences um, the, 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 um, the health of these remote sites. But how do we know that these perturbations, for example, in the gut microbiome are actually drivers of a disease as opposed to just a bystander effect of the disease process itself? Well, to do that, we leverage a, a tool that we have in our armory called notobiotic mice. These are animals that are sterile. They're, they're raised without an, uh, any microbes colonizing them inside or out. And what we can do is we can actually transfer the fecal material from an individual, a healthy control, or perhaps a, a, a patient experiencing a condition or a disease, into these microbiome, into these mice to provide them with human microbes. And we call these humanized mice. And using the, this mouse model, we now have an ever increasing range of conditions and diseases that are, we now know are driven by the gut microbiome. In his seminal um, studies, while uh, Peter Turnbull was a, a, a graduate student at Jeff Gordon's lab in Wash U, uh, Peter demonstrated that humanizing mice with the feces of patients who were experiencing obesity compared to healthy individuals, transfer the obesogenic phenotype to the recipient mice, demonstrating for the first time that the gut microbiome was a driver of obesity in these individuals. This has since been shown for Kawashikor, which is a, a wasting disease, um, for food allergy more recently, in, and in that the transmission of feces from a food allergic infant, uh, recapitulated features of food allergy in the recipient animals. And even more excitingly, um, just over two years ago, Gil Sharon in uh, Circus Masmanian's group demonstrated quite beautifully that again, humanizing previously germ-free mice with the feces from children with autism spectrum disorder uh, conferred many features of the, of the neurobehavioral condition on the recipient mice. So these, these studies collectively tell us that the gut microbiome is really crucial, not just for gastrointestinal health, but for uh, systemic health and for conditions that we would never have previously linked to the gastrointestinal microbiome, such as autism spectrum disorder. So how might the gut microbiome have such control over various aspects of human physiology and, and biology? Well, we've largely thought of the gut microbiome really as a, a site where dietary compounds are metabolized. It's a really good example of symbiosis between the microbiome and the human host. We rely on microbes to metabolize complex carbohydrates, for example, things like fiber can only be uh, digested by our gut microbiome. And the, the, the synergy of this is that we as, as humans require the small molecules produced from dietary metabolism of fiber by microbes, which are short chain fatty acids, 
as um, an anti-inflammatory molecule, as anti-proliferative molecules, and as an energy source for the cells lining the gastrointestinal tract. So we really rely on our gut microbiome and its massive repertoire of genetic capacity for the capacity to simply metabolize many of the dietary substrates that we consume. But more recently, what we've understood from the human microbiome field is that microbes also encode the capacity to metabolize things like industrial chemicals and pollutants and even pharmaceuticals that we are administered. And in these cases, these chemicals and pollutants and pharmaceuticals can be transformed uh, in a way that influences disease risk, their bioavailability, whether we actually reach a therapeutic uh, threshold for some of our pharmaceuticals is dictated by the, the activity of microbes in the gut microbiome. In some cases, these uh, compounds can be converted to more toxic compounds or they can be uh, degraded and lose efficacy based on the types of microbes and their activities in the gut microbiome. And this has really opened up a brand new field of microbial pharm uh, pharmacology in which we are now considering the activities and the encoded functions of the microbiome as a, as a key player in dictating whether we can reach bioavailable therapeutic concentrations and how uh, a variety of, of dietary and um, environmental compounds that we are exposed to are transformed by our microbiome. And as I mentioned at the outset, amongst our, our tools in our armory, um, the application of metabolomic analyses has really allowed us to push the field further towards understanding the small molecules that mediate interactions between our microbiomes and the human host. And I'm not gonna read through all of these here, but there's an ever expanding um, list of bioactive molecules that microbes produce. And these are just a handful of key ones, such as short-chain fatty acids, which I mentioned, bile acids, which are produced by the host, but transformed into secondary bile acid by the gut microbiome, which then regulate a whole range of key signaling pathways that regulate inflammatory responses and, and other um, uh, features of host physiology. Right down to aryl hydrocarbon, uh, ligands. These are metabolites of tryptophan, which is a, a dietary component uh, that we all consume. And how our microbes metabolize that tryptophan really dictates the, the signaling process downstream. And again, the, the receptors for these small molecules, these microbial derived small molecules on human cells regulate many aspects of mucosal immunity and T cell uh, and dendritic cell biology. These are key groups of cells in the immune response that regulate uh, host health. So the bottom line is that we've really uncovered um, the fact that microbes produce a much larger breadth of small molecules than we had uh, previously considered, and that many of these are bioactive and mediate the interactions between microbiomes and the human host. And just to get to um, how the gut microbiome may actually um, mediate its effects on remote organ sites, you know, some really wonderful work has emerged over the last several years, allowing us to understand that at least one mechanism by how this occurs is through the production of those small molecules by the gut microbiome. Wonderful work from Elaine Xiao and Daewoo Kang, some of which I'll, I'll talk about a little later in the presentation, have demonstrated that microbial production of small molecules in the gut um, entered the CNS and influenced um, neurological behavior. And these include things like ethyl phenyl sulfate, serotonin, and even indole, which regulate some of those signaling pathways that we talked about in the last slide. Steve Hazen's group has shown quite beautifully that microbial metabolism of carnitine, which is found in high concentrations in red meat, leads to the production of trimethylamine. And we know that trimethylamine concentrations, high, elevated concentrations of trimethylamine in the circulation are promote cardiovascular disease, specifically atherosclerosis. And in fact, the group has shown that if you prevent microbial transformation of carnitine to trimethylamine in animal models, you can actually prevent the uh, development of atherosclerosis in those, uh, in those mice. 
indicating that the microbial production of this small molecule is really a primary driver of arthrosclerotic plaques in those animals. In our own group, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the presentation, we've demonstrated that gut microbial production of a small molecule, 1213-dihome, which is a, an oxylipin, promotes uh, regulatory dysfunction in the airways and exacerbates allergic inflammation. So this is just one mechanism by which activities in the gut microbiome can actually regulate the, the health of remote organ systems suggesting that targeting the gut microbiome may open up a brand new avenue for um, treatment for conditions, again, that we had not considered the gut microbiome to be implicated in. So now that we know all of this information, what, uh, what can we do to leverage um, these very large data sets that we generate and these molecular profiles that we can um, uncover to uh, prevent and predict and treat disease? And for the second part of the, the presentation, I'll talk about efforts in the field to leverage microbiomes to predict disease, to uncover mechanistically how microbes are actually promoting disease development in early life. And I'll talk a little bit about approaches that are ongoing to manipulate the microbiome to um, shape its interaction with the human host and promote health. So, when I began to think about this, about how we could leverage microbiomes to predict disease, I turned to the field of uh, ecological theory because we've been studying ecosystems for much longer than we've been studying microbial ecosystems in the human host. And one of the um, ecological theories that really struck me was that when an ecosystem is developing and accumulating species into the ecosystem, this is called primary succession. And what we know is that the initial species that colonize that previously pristine ecosystem can dictate the rate of species accumulation into the developing ecosystem. And so I thought this could also be true for humans. And if it was true, we should be really looking in very early life at a very defined time point at a single site to understand whether we could see distinct seed organisms or, or microbiomes in very early infancy that would predict disease development way later in childhood. And that's exactly what we asked. We asked, could the infant microbiome actually prevent or predict rather childhood disease development? And if this was true, could we begin to understand the origins of disease development and specifically chronic inflammatory disease development? So to do this, we first collaborated with Christine Cole Johnson and Dennis Olby at the Henry Ford Hospital. And Chris and Dennis had accumulated a birth cohort. This means they had sampled babies in very early life and followed those, those children throughout their childhood development. And uh, they had collected stool samples from these babies. And so we used 130 one month old stool samples from this wheels uh, birth cohort. And we profiled those stool samples using 16S ribosomal RNA to look at the bacterial fingerprint and ITS2 to look at the fungal fingerprint in the feces of these babies. And as I mentioned, Chris and Dennis had followed those babies. And so they knew if they developed allergic sensitization or, or atopy at two years of age and asthma at four years of age. And rather than stratifying the babies by their outcomes, we took an agnostic approach to this. We asked an algorithm to tell us whether it could see distinct gut microbial, my, microbiome, gut microbial communities, distinct gut microbial communities in these one month old babies. And the answer was three, always seems to be the magic number. Um, we could see three significantly different gut microbiome configurations in these one month old babies. So the next question was, did they relate to the atopy and asthma outcomes years later in childhood? And what we found was a resounding yes. This neonatal gut microbiome or NGM3 group of infants had a very distinct microbiome from these NGM1 or NGM2 babies. And they were at significantly higher risk of developing atopy at two years of age and asthma at four years of age when compared to either the NGM1 or the NGM2 babies. So the next obvious question was, well, how are they different? 
what is, what is it about their gut microbiome that predicts they're at significantly higher risk of developing disease in later childhood? Well, it turns out these um, infants with this NGM3 uh, gut microbiome at one month of age really were depleted of a whole range of bacteria that we saw in the healthy NGM1 and NGM2 babies. They had a significant enrichment of fungi, specifically Candida and Rhodoterula, which are known pro-allergic fungal species. And we took the 16S data and predicted the functions of these microbiomes based on that 16S data. There's a, a software that allows us to do this. And as we, as we would have predicted, we found that these NGM3 uh, infant gut microbiomes were really functionally deficient. They had lost a whole range of encoded genes and pathways uh, because they had lost all of these bacteria from their gut microbiome. And the majority of these functional pathways that were lost were involved in microbial metabolism. And so we used metabolomic analysis to look at the small molecules produced by these three different gut microbiomes. And indeed what we found was that this NGM3 gut microbiome was metabolically distinct. It was potently glycolytic, meaning that we saw a huge enrichment of simple sugars in this gut microbiome. It was a very different microbial metabolic machine in these one month old babies. It was also depleted of several polyunsaturated fatty acids. You probably know these better as omega-3 uh, and omega-6s or fish oils. And these are very anti-inflammatory along with steroid metabolites, which again, we know downregulate inflammation. So what this suggested to us is that these high risk one month old infants have a potently inflammatory microbiome that really is lacking the capacity to downregulate inflammation once it starts. But we wanted to test this. We, we had no real way to, to do this in the babies because all we had was infant stool. And so we thought a little bit outside the box and we developed a new assay in which we took uh, donated blood from healthy adult donors. And from that, we purified two different cell types, dendritic cells or DCs and naive T cells. And these cells like to dance together quite a lot. Dendritic cells are a key group of what we call antigen presenting cells that present allergens and pieces of microbes um, to naive T cells. And once that happens, the naive T cells then flicker on and decide to become uh, a different type of and what we call an effector T cell. And they can be Th1, Th2, Th17, or regulatory T cells. All of these Th1, 2, and 17 cells can be potently inflammatory. And these T regulatory cells are kind of the peacekeepers. They dial down the inflammation that's mediated by these inflammatory T cells in response to what was presented by the dendritic cells to the naive T cells. And so what we did was we took the fecal samples from our one month old babies. We filtered out all the cells. So now what we're left with are the small molecules that are produced by those microbiomes. And we incubated those with the dendritic cells that we purified for about two days, washed them, and then co-incubated them with the naive cells and then asked, what do they become? How are they responding to the products of the high-risk NGM3 or the low-risk NGM1 microbiome? And for those of you who are not very familiar with um, allergic asthma and the immune dysfunction that's characteristic of the condition, in um, children who have allergic asthma, they have very few regulatory T cells and they have a large number or expansion of these Th2 cells, these inflammatory T cells that produce IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. These are the small molecules that mediate allergic inflammation. And they, uh, in their circulation, in their serum, uh, allergic children have high concentrations of an immunoglobulin called IgE. And as I said, on the flip side, they have very few regulatory T cells. These mediators of the peace that downregulate this inflammatory response. And these regulatory T cells downregulate inflammation by producing IL-10. And so when we performed our assay, what we found was that the high-risk gut microbiome uh, expanded the number of Th2 cells in our assay and increased their production of the inflammatory cytokine IL-4. And in parallel, reduced the frequency of regulatory T cells. 
So in essence, the small molecules produced by the high risk one month old infant gut microbiome could recapitulate the cardinal features of allergic inflammation in vitro in a test tube. So we began digging to ask what is it in this kind of metabolic gemisch that may be mediating this, this immune dysfunction in these babies in very early life. We did a lot of analysis that I won't bore you with and came up with multiple routes that led us to this one molecule, 1213-dihome. As I mentioned earlier, it's an oxylipin and it was highly enriched in the highest risk babies in our cohort. And we took the same assay. And now instead of using the fecal extract, we just used this lipid and asked whether this lipid could recapitulate any of the features of immune dysfunction we'd seen with the fecal products. And what we saw was that it, in, as we increased the concentration of 1213 diahome, we decreased the frequency of regulatory T cells and their capacity to produce the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10, telling us that this one molecule we be single-handedly responsible for this kind of phenotype that we had seen that's so critical uh, and central to allergic inflammation. So our, our next step was to ask whether this all actually happened in a, a mammalian system, because to date what we've done was in a, a test tube essentially. And so to do this, we used a model called um, the intratracheal cockroach allergen challenge. This is how we essentially induce allergic inflammation in the airways of animals to model what happens in a child when they have um, a, allergic asthma. In this case, we treated the animals with the lipid 1213 dihome, and some were treated with uh, control. And we followed these animals over time. And what we found was that the animals that received the 1213 dihome and had their airways challenged with cockroach antigen had profound influx of inflammatory cells in their airways. These are these purple staining nucleated cells. And that's true in the parenchyma of the lung as well as in the blood vessels of the lung. And just as we'd seen in our test tubes, these animals were unable to mount a regulatory T cell response, which we suspect adds to this allergic inflammation in the animals. And they showed significant increases in circulating serum IgE, that antibody that is elevated in children with the disease. So we next asked you know, and hypothesized that it's microbes that are driving this production of this lipid in the gut. And so we searched for a, an, an enzyme, a gene that encodes an enzyme called epoxide hydrolase. The epoxide hydro hydrolases catalyze the conversion, uh, the final step in the, in the production of 1213 dihome. And so we searched through all of the genes in the gut microbiome of these babies and found that the one month old infants who went on to develop ATP or asthma years later in childhood had significant increases in epoxide hydrolase genes in their gut microbiome. We went on to show that three of these genes had the capacity specifically to produce 1213 dihome, that oxylipin that drives this allergic inflammation and exacerbates it. So we next took these genes and cloned them into E. coli. So we took E. coli that can't normally produce 1213 dihome and gave it the capacity to produce this lipid by virtue of, of cloning in these genes from these organisms from the infant gut microbiome. We then set up another mouse experiment, again, using airway allergen challenge. And in this case, we had four groups, two groups were challenged in the airways and two of these groups got the E. coli orally supplemented. So we're now introducing E. coli with the capacity to produce 1213 dihome into the gut microbiome and asking how that impacts the airways of these animals when they're challenged with allergen. And the first thing we noticed was that when we gave animals the capacity to produce 1213 dihome in their gut microbiome, we saw significant increases in the concentrations of this lipid in their circulation, showing for the first time that gut microbial production of this lipid enters the circulation and in fact, we'd seen it also in the airways of these animals. And then just as we'd seen in our other models, the animals who had the capacity to produce 1213 dihome in their gut microbiome 
were the ones that showed a, a lack of capacity to induce regulatory T cells and dial down the allergic inflammation in their airways. Again, demonstrating to us that gut microbial derived uh, lipids, in this case, 1213 dihome, can enter the circulation and exacerbate allergic inflammation in the airways, really allowing us to focus on the gut microbiome as a kind of a central component to the genesis of allergic asthma development in childhood. And just in case you think that this is only uh, related to, um, to allergies and asthma, there's, there's been other studies that have really corroborated these findings. In our own studies in a separate birth cohort, we've demonstrated that not only do babies at high risk for allergy and asthma start life with a different seed microbiome in their meconium, their first bowel movement, they start with a very different microbiome. They also have a very different trajectory of microbiome development over the first year of life. So really consistent with that ecosystems um, theory that the seed organisms really are important for the accumulation of microbes into the niche. And in this case, uh, the children at high risk for atopy show um, delayed accumulation of microbes into their gut microbiome. Again, consistent with what we've seen that these microbiomes are depleted of a whole range of microbial functions that we think are necessary to promote appropriate immune development and prevent allergic disease from developing. But it's not just allergy um, and asthma. A pair of partner papers were published in 2018 demonstrating something very similar in a completely independent cohort where type 1 diabetes was the outcome. There they showed that there were very early life perturbations to the gut microbiome that related to the development of type 1 diabetes in later childhood, and that specifically bacterial pathways for the production of those short chain fatty acids were depleted. That was a characteristic of these one month old babies who went on to develop uh, type 1 diabetes. In our own unpublished work, which is currently in review, um, we've demonstrated something very similar for childhood obesity uh, in a much larger cohort than we originally used in the wheels um, study. We've demonstrated that at one month of age, babies with a distinct gut microbiome that shows accelerated development, it looks like a much older microbiome than it should be at one month of age, that this is associated with the development of childhood obesity. Moreover, we've taken a similar approach where we've taken the cell-free products of that gut microbiome and layered them onto cultured intestinal epithelial cells and demonstrated not only do those, um, those extracts damage the epithelium when they are sourced from these high risk for childhood obesity babies, but they also reprogram transcription and the types of genes that are being expressed by the intestinal lining um, in, these, um, in, in, these, in these assays, really providing us with insights into how very early life microbiomes are reprogramming human physiology in very early life to trigger and uh, promote disease development much later in childhood. So now that we know that the early life microbiome can um, promote disease in later childhood, how are we thinking about manipulating the microbiome to promote health? As I mentioned at the outset, the, the microbiome is really flexible. We know this because we know that there's so many factors that shape its, its uh, composition and activities. Can we leverage this to start re-engineering microbiomes to promote health? And so one study that we've been involved in was the, um, the TIP study or the trial of infant probiotic supplementation. This was in collaboration with Michael Cabana uh, while he was at UCSF. And Michael had infants who were at high risk for asthma and healthy controls. And the high risk babies were supplemented daily, but with one by 10 to the 10 colony forming units of a commercial probiotic lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, or half of the population received a placebo. They were supplemented daily for six months of age. Then there was a six month washout period. And then at the end of three years, uh, he assessed allergy and wheeze. And the, the spoiler alert is that there was no significant difference in those infants who had been previously supplemented over the first six months of life versus those that were not in terms of their allergy and wheeze outcomes at three years. But Michael had collected stool samples during this trial, and we leveraged those um, and used them to examine the types of bacteria that were present 
and their metabolic or small molecule productivity to understand perhaps why this treatment had failed. And the first thing that we found was, as I've mentioned, uh, compared to healthy children shown here in green who accumulate bacterial diversity rapidly over the first 12 months of life, those who are at high risk and in the placebo arm had this significant delay in microbial diversification over the first year of life. And those who were at high risk who received the lactobacillus rhamnosus still remained significantly different in terms of their diversity, but really now showed a different trajectory of microbial accumulation into their gut microbiome over this first 12 months of life, telling us that supplementation of these very young infants is both safe and, and, and does change the trajectory of microbiome development in these infants. We went on to show that at the end of the six month supplementation period, the fecal metabolome or the small molecules produced by the microbiome of babies who received the lactobacillus rhamnosus GG was significantly more similar to that of healthy babies compared to the placebo supplemented babies. But consistent with the idea that there was no significant difference at three years of age in the clinical outcome, by 12 months of age, uh, six months after the supplementation ended, we no longer saw that metabolic similarity in the fecal productivity of these babies, suggesting that perhaps these, um, that, that the, there's no legacy effect of having previously been supplemented with this probiotic. But of course, we wanted to understand whether the supplementation, at least up to six months of age, had any impact on how microbiomes may impact the key features of immune function associated with allergy. So we went back to our favorite assay with the dendritic and the naive T cells and uh, used the fecal extracts from the six month and 12 month old uh, babies and asked what we found. And what we did see that was for as long as the babies were supplemented, we saw that their fecal products induced more anti-inflammatory T regulatory cells and increased their IL-10 productivity. But by 12 months of age, what we found is that there was no significant difference. We did not have this lasting effect on the interaction between these microbiomes and immune response six months after the probiotic had uh, stopped being supplemented to the babies. And this was consistent with when we'd examined the burden of the probiotic in the feces of the babies, you can see here in blue, that as long as the probiotic was being supplemented, these babies had significantly increased burden of this probiotic species in their feces. But once the supplementation stopped by nine months and 12 months of age, the probiotic had essentially washed out of the system and no longer was having an impact on microbial metabolic productivity that may impact long-term uh, the immune response. And so these studies were confirmed by a really wonderful um, study that was published a little later in the same year in 2018 uh, from Aaron Segal's group. And here they're examining adult participants in a study, not babies. And these adult participants were supplemented either again with placebo or with a mix of 10 um, commercially available probiotic species for one month or 28 days. There was extensive, again, um, sampling of the gastrointestinal tract right up from the upper GI tract to the lower GI tract in these 10 individuals. And there was a follow-up period in which the individuals were examined. And some of the key findings from this study was much as we'd seen in the infants, probiotic supplementation leads to the detection of probiotic species in the feces during the period of supplementation. But after supplementation ends, these species are no longer sustained. They do not engraft in the gastrointestinal tract. What was as interesting is that these species have specific niche proclivities. So for example, um, this uh, here we can see that many of these species colonize the uh, descending colon, but not other sites in the gastrointestinal tract, suggesting that uh, the empiric probiotic uh, supplementation does not universally and certainly does not persistently impact the gut lining or the gut mucosa. And so what this suggests is that your response to a probiotic supplement may be very personal. The authors also demonstrated that the success of a microbe in colonizing a niche 
was really dependent on which microbes were there in advance of the supplementation. If very similar microbes were present, the probiotic species did not colonize the niche. And so this uh, allows us to understand somewhat why some individuals may respond to probiotics and some may not. And it also suggests that there's a, a need for rationally designed microbial cellular therapeutics. Uh, organisms that successfully engraft into the gastrointestinal tract to sustain their effect on the microbiome. And those that are chosen uh, for their functions and not simply for the fact that they can survive transit through the upper gastrointestinal tract. So beyond probiotic supplementation, we also um, have known from the, the field for the last few years that fecal microbial transplant can be an effective treatment for a number of conditions. And this involves the wholesale reconstitution of a gastrointestinal microbiome by taking the fecal contents of a healthy individual, generating a slurry, and then either colonically or uh, nasogastrically or orally uh, providing those organisms uh, to uh, uh, an individual with a, an infection or a condition that requires microbiome rebuilding in the gut. And you know, some of the key conditions that have been uh, linked to successes with this treatment have been Clostridium difficile infection. In fact, the original trial, which was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine some years ago, had to be shut down prematurely because 92% of the participants in the fecal microbial transplant arm responded to this therapy compared to 30% of participants on the standard of care, which was vancomycin taper. And it was unethical to continue to use the standard of care as treatment for these patients. In our ulcerative colitis studies at, uh, at UCSF, we've demonstrated that we can actually get about 40% response rate in this population with a fecal microbial transplant regime that we've developed. But I'm gonna spend the last few minutes talking about uh, autism spectrum disorder and the use of this uh, treatment modality in populations of children with this condition. And I have to say, I loved this study when it came out because the idea that we can manipulate the gut microbiome to have an effect on a remote organ system for me is a very exciting prospect for the field of microbiome medicine, but also for the field of, of human health. And so in this um, trial of 19 children, uh, children received two weeks of vancomycin antimicrobial therapy to clear out their pathogenic microbiome. They received a, a Prilosec to reduce acid and a movie prep, which really clears the gastrointestinal tract in advance of fecal microbial transplant um, through a, an oral and a colonic route. They then underwent uh, what we called a maintenance dose which these are capsules of lyophilized uh, uh, fecal microbiome, which are consumed um, daily by mouth for a month. And then they followed these children out to 10 weeks and then out to 18 weeks and collected a various uh, a number of samples and measured their disease activity with a number of, of various metrics. And what was stunning was that um, these children showed significant improvements in their gastrointestinal symptom rating score, the majority of them showing significant improvements over time with the treatment. And this was consistent with an increase in parent global impression scores. And while this is subjective, it is a measure of the degree of improvement in these uh, children from a neurobehavioral standpoint. There was a variety of other metrics for improvement in these children. I'm not showing them all here. So this suggested that a, a, a month long intervention to reshape the microbiome in these children could significantly improve their um, neurobehavioral symptomology associated with ASD. What the authors also showed was that in those uh, who responded, which was the majority of these children, their gut microbiome was really restored with this treatment. And the diversity of the microbiome now was similar to that of neurotypical children, of the median um, diversity in neurotypical children. But I think what excited me most about this study is that the investigators went the extra mile and followed these children out for two years following their initial treatment. And this is the data from the first eight weeks after treatment had ceased. But here's two years later, 
And these children still show significant improvements in their gastrointestinal scores and their parents' um, assessment of their, of their um, improvements. And to really summarize all of the assessments that were made in these children, here we can see a baseline before the children started the treatment where the majority of them have severe symptoms and a small portion of mild to moderate symptoms. And after uh, on week 18, after eight weeks of treatment, you can see that this has significantly shifted, where now a portion of these children have minimal to no symptoms. Uh, the majority have, uh, while others have uh, mild to moderate, and really we've shifted from 80% with the, from the severe um, category to more like 40%. But again, what's really exciting is that this, re, this perturbation and reassembly of the microbiome in these children by two years after the treatment led to an even further reduction in the number of participants who had severe symptomology. And now the majority of these children have mild to moderate or minimal to no symptoms following this one week of fecal microbial transplant um, treatment. So to summarize, I hope what I have um, conveyed today or this evening is that early life really represents a key period in human microbiome development. It's a critical period when microbes train immune function, and that sets the stage for our trajectory uh, of health or disease development. And what we've learned is that we can leverage microbiome tools and data to predict childhood disease, or um, and we've all, you'll hear later from Dr. Um, Sirota actually about how uh, we can leverage these data to examine adverse pregnancy outcomes also. And then finally, we, we now know that microbiome manipulation strategies, particularly microbiome manipulation of the gut, may offer really novel opportunities to develop interventions for a whole range of diseases and not simply those that manifest in the gastrointestinal tract, but those that are also uh, manifest at, at remote organ sites. And so obviously this work takes a village and I feel incredibly fortunate to work with some really wonderful investigators, not all of whom are mentioned here, but these are the people whose uh, hard work and efforts I've, I've presented um, today or this evening on this, this talk. And I want to specifically call out uh, Kate Fujimura and Sophia Levin, whose uh, work I, I highlighted. And in particular, our collaborators at Henry Ford Hospital and Georgia Health Sciences Health System at the University of Michigan, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, San Francisco State University, and our team within the Benioff Center for Microbiome Medicine, uh, Kristen and Sarah, who have just been stalwart support as we've developed the center and um, supported my work as well as my work within the center. And then finally, to thank our funders, and in particular, the NIH, the, the NIAID, who are stalwart supporters of our research and our efforts in this field. Thank you so much, Sue. And we have um, a long list of questions. So I'll just start going through those threes. The first one is about uh, COVID. So, and I know we've done some work on COVID, although you didn't present it today. So what is kind of known about the microbiome and the respiratory tract in COVID? Are there correlations between airway microbiome and COVID severity um, or studies on viral bacterial co-infection? Yeah, and we have we we have uh, just published a paper on that actually, and I didn't cover it tonight. Uh, looking at the the upper airway uh, microbiome and COVID outcomes, and indeed we do see relationships. and And those that are colonized with respiratory pathogens do much worse with COVID infection, as you might imagine. But I think what's really exciting for us in this field is that what we see there really um, phenocopies what we see in children with asthma. When these children uh, and individuals who get COVID infection, what that allows for is the underlying um, microbiome in the upper airways to bloom. Specific pathogens bloom during those viral infectious events. And depending on whether you have um, very specific respiratory pathogens when that infectious event occurs, that seems to dictate the outcomes. And we we showed that um, those who did uh, worse with COVID infection had respiratory pathogens that promoted downstream pneumonia. We also have work, some work coming out in the gastrointestinal microbiome um, and COVID infection as well. And, and others have shown that there are perturbations in the gut microbiome associated with COVID, but it's a little earlier for us for that, that study. And I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily go into the details of it. Thank you. 
in uh, pediatric asthma patients that ultimately go on to outgrow their asthma or have a reduction in severity as they get older, is there something known about, um, is the improvement explained by the microbiome or some other factor? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And it frequently happens to boys during puberty. Um, and it's a, an area that we are actively going after. Uh, we suspect that it may be related to hormonal changes and how they influence the microbiome across the system, not just in, necessarily in the gastrointestinal tract. And some really wonderful work from um, Heidi Kong's group at the NIH has demonstrated that hormonal changes during puberty, depending on the stage of puberty, has really profound effects on the dermal microbiome. And remember that allergy is not just allergic airway disease, but also atopic conditions that manifest on the skin. And so that gives us some early inklings that it may be that those who resolve their condition during puberty it may be related to developmental hormonal changes that are influencing, again, the types and activities of microbes at various sites across the, the, the human body. But that's an area that we are just delving into. Uh, our children in some of these earlier birth cohorts are now hitting those um, puberty stages and entering the reproductive years. And we have samples that we're getting ready to, to start working on. Okay. Very good. We have a few questions um, focusing on the very early establishment of the microbiome um, in infancy. So what, uh, what seems to dictate the composition of that initial microbiome in the meconium itself? Is it you know, the, the baby's genetics, the maternal genetics, maternal diet? What do we know about that? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's again, one that we and many others are, are actively after. My suspicion is that it's a number of things, but um, what we can point to um, is a study that is uh, currently has been revised and we're waiting on a, on a, 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 a result on that in the, in the coming weeks. One in which we examined um, mother infant diets, about 182 mother infant diets, where we were examining the vaginal microbiome and the mother at 36 weeks gestation, and then the gut microbiome and their paired babies at either one or two months of age. And what we found is that the vaginal microbiome in the mother is related to the mother's environmental exposures to her maternal stress and depression um, levels, which again, we think are related to things like cortisol and you know, potently um, antimicrobial products that are produced in response to stress. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also related to the mother's allergic um, status. But what was really key in that study is we demonstrated that the, for all babies, all babies shared about the same number of bacteria between their gut microbiome and their mother's vaginal microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we're looking at what's transmitted from mother to child. Um, but it, it's not the number of microbes that matter. It turns out it's the types of microbes that are transmitted from the mother's vaginal tract to the gastrointestinal tract that really matter uh, for whether the baby goes on to develop uh, early um, uh, biomarkers of allergic sensitization. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what we think is that in addition to uh, genetic factors that probably relate to inheritance of disease, there is clearly a microbial inherited component of disease. We found with mothers who had allergic asthma transmitted very different microbes to their babies. And then their babies went on to develop elevated um, immunoglobulin E or IgE in their circulation. So suggesting that there's this intergenerational microbial transmission of microbes that contribute to the heritability of some of these conditions. So, so cool. Uh, for the, um, in that very early few months, what is known about um, the mothers, whether they're, the babies are um, exclusively breastfed, formula fed, a combination, supplementation, uh, how, does that, how does that influence kind of these clustering of microbes that you see um, across yeah. babies in those first few months? Yeah, well, you know, again, because there's so many factors that are influencing the microbiome and shaping it subtly, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly early life uh, mode of nutrition has an impact. And we, we know that from uh, the most recent study that is currently in review. There we examined um, more than 400 one month old babies. And so three different, again, gut microbiome uh, structures or compositions, one of which was associated with downstream childhood obesity, 
uh, and overweight phenotypes. And that group were more likely to be formula fed. And in fact, what we see in that gut microbiome is that we don't, we seem to have lost the kind of regulatory control of breast milk on microbiome development. We know that that happens. Um, wonderful work from Frederick Backhead demonstrated that it's not the introduction of solid foods that leads to the diversification of the microbiome in the earliest stages over the first year of life. It's actually the cessation of breastfeeding suggesting that breastfeeding has a very strong regulatory control on which microbes are permitted to occupy the developing gut microbiome. And with formula feeding, while it provides substrates for um, the microbiome and the host, uh, nutritional substrates, it doesn't provide that regulatory control. And we think that that uh, may be a very, very key reason why things like formula feeding increase the risk of developing allergic asthma in later childhood. Mm -hmm. And in, I, I think with our uh, allergic asthma studies, we didn't have the numbers that we needed. We only had 130 um, babies in that study, but when we expanded out to over 400 children, then we started to see the relationship between early life mode of nutrition and disease development later in childhood that seems to be mediated through the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, changing gears a little bit, what do we know about the social determinants of health and the human microbiome? To what extent does, um, you know, access to, to healthy food or socioeconomic yeah. status kind of influence uh, your ability to colonize these healthy gut microbes yeah. that you need for your health? Sadly, um, we think it plays a major role. And again, from that same um, study with childhood obesity and overweight phenotypes as the outcome, beyond the increased frequency of formula feeding, the other factors that we found to be associated with that highest risk gut microbiome were uh, correlates of structural racism. Uh, there were things like um, uh, reduced um, formal education of the mothers, um, single mothers. Um, these were, were all things that we found associated with that high risk microbiome. And you know, what, what's, it, it's, it's interesting that we'll, we're finding those correlates. I, I think it really, um, shows us that these things like structural racism, which we know cause disparities in health, may be um, mediating their effect through the impact on the microbiome in very early life. Can you comment a little bit on uh, what, what we might know um, about if there is this kind of variation, socioeco socioeconomic variation in the microbiome, um, how that might be biasing what our vision of, you know, um, a healthy microbiome looks like if our co patient cohorts aren't necessarily representative of the full population at large? Yeah, well, they, they tend to be. I mean, we work in really diverse populations. I've always made that something that we... We, we, that, that's why we've partnered with the incredible people that we partner with, because they are you know, racially and socioeconomically diverse populations, frequently centered in inner city populations, which are, again, disproportionately impacted um, mm -hmm. with uh, adverse health outcomes. So I, I think, at least speaking for myself, uh, we feel that these are generalizable findings and that we're really, by, by studying these populations, starting to see that these relationships exist which allow us you know, to, to really start pushing on and how we can make uh, changes um, to societal changes. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to understand how these societal impacts may be influencing health via the microbiome, but I think the, the underlying message is that we need to change these societal um, uh, influences that, that dis disproportionately impact uh, populations um, and impact their, their, their health status. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll next focus on that Kane study for autism spectrum disorder. Um, so the one attendee said it's almost too good to be true. Has that you know dramatic and persistent um, effect of fecal transplant been reproduced? Are there objective changes in neurological function that correlate with PGI three score? Yeah, no, I agreed. And there are several. Uh, clinical trials that have occurred, many of which have closed and we're all waiting with bated breath for the next study that comes out uh, uh, to, to corroborate those findings. I will say as well, it wasn't a placebo controlled trial, which was one of the criticisms of, of that, that study. Um, but from our own perspective as well, I think the reason I'm optimistic about it is that you know, we found in our ulcerative colitis studies that for example, if we did not pre-treat with antimicrobial um, treatment before introduction of the fecal microbial transplant, we saw no response. And moreover, if we only did a single fecal microbial transplant, 
we saw no response. It's only when we recapitulated the a strategy that was used in that trial of an antimicrobial pretreatment and a month long treatment with fecal microbial transplant that we got to 40% efficacy in that population. So it suggests to me that you really need, and, and to be fair, we need a clinical trial that recapitulates exactly that treatment and not simply one or two uh, FMTs and, and then see how it goes. Um, the other thing that we've um, revealed in our studies is that the patients who fail that fecal microbial transplant um, uh, intervention for ulcerative colitis are those that are enriched for antimicrobial resistance determinants that allow them not to be impacted by that pretreatment. So it suggests to us that maybe what we need to do at the outset is understand the antimicrobial resistance profile of an individual, mm -hmm. tailor the antimicrobial pretreatment to that profile so that we know we will disrupt that pathogenic microbiome before we in, uh, introduce that fecal microbial transplant and sustain that selective pressure on the microbiome for uh, a month or perhaps longer to have more long-term sustained effects. The other reason I think that that, that trial had such uh, um, um, impressive impacts is that they are treating younger children. I think we're you know, in that stage, we're still evolving our microbiome. Um, and I, I, I believe that that may be also the key that earlier is better in terms of treatment. We've certainly seen that in completely um, different uh, scenarios. For example, in peanut oral immunotherapy for the treatment of peanut allergy, the earlier peanut is introduced to children, the more likely they are to desensitize and induce tolerance to peanut. And so that tells us that there's something really special about the early life and early childhood period that is uh, more plastic and that interventions applied there have a greater propensity for long lasting effect on human health. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, increased sanitation either you know as a as a report as a response to covid or just living in the built environment where people are showering more frequently than they historically have and using antibacterial soap um, what that might be doing to our uh, human microbiome yeah well this is one of my other um, favorite areas that we research as well we've we for many years examined the environmental uh, microbiome and the built environment and asked whether there's relationships between the types of microbes that we find in the environment of babies in early life and whether those babies go on to develop allergies and asthma. And, and in, in, in fact, we do find a very strong correlation between um, environmental house dust microbiomes and asthma development in children raised in those homes. And more specifically, just like in the gut microbiome, the homes that are, are uh, more sanitized, and have fewer, much lower diversity of microbes. There are far fewer types of microbes. It, they're the houses in which children raised in those houses uh, go on with much higher rates to develop allergies and asthma. And so how we put all this together, we, we think the same is probably true with, with COVID and, and it, other conditions where we're really sanitizing uh, places. And I get this question frequently, what do we think it means for allergy development in, in populations? And I guess time will tell, but I. Um, I'm not sure that it bodes well, um, but um, yeah, certainly what, what we've seen and, and how we put this together is we think that the environmental microbiome, especially in early life, serves as the library of microbes that are available for accumulation into the various microbiomes across various body habitats in the human host. And that if you lack these microbes in the environment, um, that perhaps it's, it's impossible to kind of gain that diversity of function in the microbiome that's necessary to promote immune homeostasis and training and tolerance development to prevent allergic disease development. I think it was really striking in our, in our probiotic supplementation study in babies um, mm -hmm. in which we could change the trajectory of microbial diversity accumulation, but we could never get it back to the healthy uh, microbiomes. And we We've often wondered whether that's because these babies are being raised in very sterile conditions where they just, they don't have those microbes to accumulate from their environment. And so, yeah, it remains to be seen what increased sanita sanitation during COVID times uh, will mean for uh, allergic disease. But based on what we know from uh, prior studies, uh, the more 
sanitize the environment and the less exposure to microbes in early life, the higher the risk for allergic disease development. Uh, can you speak specifically about human milk oligosaccharides and the microbiome in early life? Yeah, I mean, this is an area of intense um, study. Um, and a little outside my wheelhouse that I've, I've read with interest in, in the field. Um, what we do know is that uh, the, the oligosaccharides in human milk support the growth and expansion of really key organisms in the gut microbiome in very early life, uh, namely uh, bifidobacteria and uh, lactobacillus species. And they seem to be really critical key kind of keystone organisms in the early life gut microbiome that shape the activities of other organisms around them. Um, and so, you know, what really strikes me about the field of breast milk research is we really focus on the milk oligosaccharides, but there's far more lipids in breast milk than there are oligosaccharides and there's proteins as well. And we don't really have a good handle on how they impact the microbiome. And given what we've seen in terms of microbial lipid production um, to skew immune function by gut microbes in the early life, we think that that's probably fertile ground for research as well. And not just thinking about the, the, um, the complex oligosaccharides, but thinking about the other components in breast milk and, and, and going beyond nutrition as well and thinking about the immunoglobulins, for example, that are transmitted from the mother to the baby that have very strong regulatory uh, effects on, again, the types and activities of microbes in that microbiome in that critical window of early life. So I think while we know a little bit about which microbes benefit from um, uh, oligosaccharides and breast milk, I think there's a lot more to do in that field. Um, and now we have the tools to do it. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and I look forward to seeing the results in, in the next few years in that field. Hmm. Uh, you spoke uh, you spoke significantly about you know tr priming the microbiome to prevent um, to prevent disease later on. Do we know anything about you leveraging the microbiome to um, acutely decrease inflammation or flare ups in acute asthma, for example, or other kind of autoimmune uh, diseases that result in inflammation? Yeah, I mean that's a study that is ongoing in our group. We are actively recruiting children who are admitted to the emergency department with an acute asthma exacerbation to understand uh, A, their, their microbiome, both in the gut and the airway, and B, the, the small molecules that are circulating that are actually driving that exacerbation, and, and, and C, what is associated with resolution of the exacerbation versus um, adverse outcomes in that population. So these are very difficult studies to do, um, to sample a child who's having an active, um, asthma exacerbation that requires hospitalization is a very traumatic event for the child and the parents. So these are very difficult studies to do, but ones that we are with um, collaborators actively engaged in and, and trying to understand, you know, are there, are there approaches that we could leverage again by, by understanding those processes of what down regulates and, and, and uh, inflammation in that acute event um, that we can we can leverage to uh, develop novel therapies to to treat acute events such as as asthma exacerbation. Then uh, the last question that we have in the current Q and A is to speak about um, specifically type one diabetes and you know what what might we know about microbiome and um, that particular disease. Yeah, much like many of the other diseases at, at this stage, you know, a lot of the work that has happened has been uh, has been descriptive. So we know that there's perturbations to the microbiome, to the gut microbiome. We know that the early life infant microbiome kind of is associated with increased risk of developing the disease. But we're really, um, I've not yet seen much work that has allowed us to understand the mechanisms by which those perturbed microbiomes may be driving um, islet cell dysfunction. I know of several studies that are ongoing um, that are actively asking those questions. Um, but again, it's a, it's a, we're at the phase in many of this, these diseases where we've now described what the perturbation is and are now moving towards developing the novel assays and leveraging functional approaches to profile the microbiome to understand the key microbial functional contri contributions to the disease. And type one diabetes falls into that, that bucket. Thank you. Well, we are um, about out of time. Oh, one, one last one that came in. Uh, 
questions about whether fecal transplant treatments could be effective for adult, adults. So you spoke about the pediatric asthma population. Can you speak specifically about, um, uh, I think, autism, autism in adults or other, you know, other yeah. applications for fecal, uh, fecal transplant? Yeah, and I should have clarified, I'm sorry. Um, the, the studies that I was talking about for ulcerative colitis are all adult studies. Mm -hmm. So there we do see efficacy. So all is not lost uh, in the adult realm. It doesn't have to be in the pediatric realm. Um, and I think what we need to do, which we are doing, is iteratively leveraging those fecal microbial transplant trials to understand who responds and how they respond and why they respond. And that's what we're actively doing. I, I didn't talk about those studies, but we, we've identified a group of microbes and a set of metabolites that are required for response to um, uh, response in ulcerative colitis patients uh, following fecal microbial transplant. So I think not just doing the trials to see you know, whether there's efficacy or not, but leveraging those human studies to understand the, the functional basis of how microbiomes mediate efficacy in adult populations is really key.